say something, you say no. Welcome back. We sincerely apologize for that break in transmission. These technical hitches happen sometimes on live TV. But we still have a conversation going. We're still talking about 21 years of democracy, looking at the National Assembly in the last 21 years. Our guests are still with us in Lagos. We have Chris Wandu, who is a publisher at CKN News. And we have Bola Oba and Daniel Akinlami joining us via Skype. In our Abuja studio, we have Jeff Odenika, a former member of the House of Reps, and Edwin Jonathan in our Port Harcourt studio, a political analyst. Let me begin with you, Chris. For so long, for so long, we have heard the National Assembly being accused of conniving with the executive arm of government. In fact, people say that rubber stamps to the executive arm of government. But some have excluded the Eighth Assembly to an extent. Uh, let's say when uh, Bukola Saraki defected to the opposing party, then we saw an opposition, a form of opposition to the executive arm of government. Would you say in the past 21 years that the um, second arm of government has been a kind of rubber stamp to the executive? Yes, um, to a large extent, I would say yes. Um, uh, before, before that, um, before the Eighth Assembly, we have a, a little resemblance of what you can term as a, a separation of power during the time of um, the uh, president, about the three presidents even, let's look at it, um, of, of the Senate. Um, Okadibo was, uh, was, was good at his job. Uh, he wasn't too much of a party person um, to a large extent. He was open-minded, independent-minded uh, during his time. Uh, then Pius Aim also, at a point also, was um, also independent-minded in his approach to leading the National Assembly. And the Ogapatapata of them all was uh, Namani. When okay. was the, yes, Ken Namani. Uh, you remember what happened um, during the third term um, agenda of the then um, President, President uh, Obasanjo. So that was a point, a point that if it wasn't neat in the board then, wouldn't have known where we are today. Probably would have had well, just like what was what is happening in other African countries, like presidents and the rest of them. If they've agreed within themselves, then despite all the uh, inducements and the rest of them, uh, and they have gone for that thought. Then by today, what would have been talking about? Wouldn't have been talking of a democracy in the true sense of it, but uh, probably a life president. Uh, that, so to that extent, you say yes. Um, at that level. They were, they, were, uh, they were good at what they were doing. Then also, also remember um, the time of Naba too. Um, I'm going to the House, House of, of Reps now. Naba was a, also a very solid um, House of Reps um, leader, uh, speaker, as yeah. it were. Then he also gave the government of the day some headache. But generally, if I now to assess the National Assembly, uh, from 1999 to um, 2020, I probably scored them about um, 35 percent uh, because that's a failure. That's fail. Well, that, means that, is, that could be an E. Mm -hmm. So uh, what it means is that they have so much potentials, but they couldn't exploit the, the National Assembly. Supposed to be the, the legislature. Let me use the word legislature now, not just National Assembly. The National Assembly, uh, the legislature, is the biggest arm or within the hierarchy of governors. They are the only elected members, if you understand what I mean. In the executive, you have just the president and the deputy that were elected. Yes, they were elected. Okay? If you go to the state, you have governors and deputy governors that were elected. They're Every other person you see, they are appointees. But all members of the legislative arm of government get elected. If you understand what I'm trying to say. Then also, to show how powerful the, uh, the legislative part of, of, of government is, during the military era, once there's a coup, the executive about for removing the president, the first thing the military does is, is to remove the uh, legislative arm. The judiciary always remains 
where it is. They are untouched. So that shows you the power because they are the representative of the people. But because of the way they, they come about, they are elected or they are picked and the rest of them, most often are not, as rightly mentioned by um, one of the... Um, Jeff. Jeff, yes. is that these guys are just appointed of the executive. Most of them are picked by um, governors and <laughs> at the National Assembly, like the senators and the rest of them. They are picked by the senators. Most often they are not. Once a, a, a governor doesn't endorse your candidate as a senator, it's always very difficult for you to get it. If he doesn't endorse your candidature as a House of Reps member, which is why you see the, the problem of the turnout of members of the... In the United States, there are some senators that have been in the Senate for over 40 years. Same in UK. Mm -hmm. But what is the average time frame of members of the... And they are the only ones that don't know, they don't have a time frame as to the number of times they can be elected. Unlike the executive, president two terms, governor two terms, a legislator does not have a time frame. He can be elected one million times. We respect the, 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 um, the, the constitution gives him that leverage. So, yeah. in terms of uh, deliveries, I, they have not been able to deliver on the promise. And a lot of challenges here and there. Mm. One, Nigerians don't trust members of our legislative arm, especially the National Assembly. If you look at what, every time, what do we debate every time? How much are their salaries? Those are the things that Nigerians think about. How much is the salary of members of the National Assembly? And that in itself brings a lot of mistrust between them and also those they are representing. If you, if you understand what I'm trying to say, then the, the executive arm. Definitely, they dance to the tune of either the governors or the presidents. And where they try to assert their independence, you will see that those in power, especially the governors, and president try as much as possible to make sure that there is a check. There used to be what we used to call the banana peels. Most, most of you have forgotten. The banana peels, yes, in the National Assembly then, where the, the, the leadership of the National Assembly, we have just been changed practically every other oh, yes, time. Yes. If, 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 you remember that vividly? Yes. yes, because once they fall out with the executive, the, executive, the next thing they want to do is, is, is to change effect a change. So most of them, are not, in order to sustain and retain their leadership, they try as much as possible to become puppets in the hands of the executive. So I think going forward, uh, the National Assembly should be able to look at enormous power that has been given them. In the area of uh, oversight, mm. there have also been serious challenges. The members of the National Assembly, as we're looking at them, some parastators have also seen them as a pain in their neck. Um, instead of doing their oversight function as it's supposed to be, um, some of the processors' heads have accused them of trying to break down on them, to give them things, to, you know, that kind of stuff. When you see, when you hear a, 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 the National Assembly going oversight, the first thing that comes to your mind is that, oh, they want to go and collect their money. This thing. But that does not mean that there have not been some certain um, sources. They, so they have, okay. uh, they have in terms of recoveries, there have been so much exposures in terms of recovery, looted funds, and the rest of them. And that in itself also... Okay, uh, Chris, let's, let's speak with uh, Bola Oba, who is joining us via Skype. Yes. Uh, Bola Oba, the conversation is about uh, the National Assembly. Yes, uh, Chris had just established the fact that, yes, they had made quite some successes. But the truth there is uh, they are not where uh, they are uh, supposed to be. And one of the issues that have been established here is the fact that... Uh, there is so much attention, uh, there is so much distraction coming from the executive arm of government uh, that is not allowing the National Assembly to function as well as they are meant to function. Uh, what are the issues? Uh, how, 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 how much can you uh, comply or rather agree with this position? I must be very honest with you. The best way to judge any legislative assembly or in a liberal democracy, the best way to judge or assess legislature, you know, we have, like uh, my friend Chris said earlier, we have executive arm of government, 
that is led by a principal officer, the president, or the governor, uh, who, was who was elected with his deputy or his vice, his vice in the case of the president. The legislature is the embodiment of all the constituencies of a polity. And from all the constituencies, members are elected to go and represent the people. So it's usually the people's harm of government. It should be the most autochthonous, the most connected with the with the constituents of of a polity. Now you want to ask the fundamental question. If they are the representatives of the people, what within the context of their primary stability, how well are they serving the people? The first the first role of the legislature in any liberal democracy is lawmaking. And you want to examine the extent to which they have used that lawmaking role to positively transform or positively affect the, the quality of lives of the people. I want to tell you without any malice, since 1999, to date, I am not particularly impressed with the quality of our legislation. In fact, if I want to, if I want to refer to any of sessions of the National Assembly, I would rather want to give a modicum of respect to the eighth session of the National Assembly, session led by. Dogara, House of Representatives, and Saraki for, for the city. Because that was actually the most productive, the most productive session of the National Assembly. They made more laws, and some of their laws seemed more patronizing, not quite, not quite potently effective as it relates to the quality of life of the people. But the most shameful for me would be the extant session of the National Assembly, the Ninth Assembly. We have, a, we have an ongoing case now of the Right Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly trying to plagiarize the statute of another polity, trying to plagiarize the Infectious Disease Act of Singapore. And in a facsimile manner, pretending to present it to, to his chamber as though it's a bill that will positively that will possibly positively rub on the quality of that in Nigeria. Ironically, the plagiaristic abuse has been found out. And the enormous, the, the enormous differences in culture, or in, enormous differences in cultures between what we in Singapore and in Nigeria, we see in the role assigned to some officers as designated in the bill or in the law on bill. So, yes, Bola, now, from the example you just gave, it just shows that. Um, perhaps some people representing us in the National Assembly have no idea of why they are there. But let's take our conversation now back to Jeff Ojinika, who was a former member of the House of Reps. Now, Jeff, you said that um, Nigerian House of Reps seems to be the highest paid world over. And from I'm sure you heard what Gwela said, that you know a particular uh, senator representing a part of Nigeria plagiarized another country's um, in a format and brought it to Nigeria as if it was going to work here. 
Do you think that um, the National Assembly members, both at the Red and Green Chambers, should be paid as much as they pay uh, when we know that um, we voted them in there to do some work and we barely see what they do in Nigeria, across Nigeria? Yeah, I think uh, the Nigerian um, National Assembly is paid uh, rightly in, li in line with um, the Revenue and Mobilization Fiscal Commission. The only thing that uh, Nigerians are, um, you know, probably uh, things that had to do with um, allowances of, of um, members, that's in terms of uh, um, the way they go about their day-to-day -day duties, whether they need um, um, committee vehicles, whether facilities needed for oversight functions and all those things are not are provided for, and then if, if they're not provided for, they should be made available. So um, moving forward, I think the, the, the only problem I, you know, people should uh, have there is in terms of uh, transparency in the, in the discharge of, uh, or in the expenditure of such funds. That uh, such funds are funds that should be, they are public funds that should be open to public scrutiny. That is, uh, if there's a, a, a fund made available to the office, of um, a particular member, that fund should be open to public in terms of uh, if you say you bought fuel, someone should be able to go and check whether you know you did buy fuel or not, or if you had a computer, or whether such computer was really bought or um, such computers were being maintained. I think it's all those things that has to do with the running of office of uh, that uh, people are all raising issues with, and that's where all those funds go to. Um, they call it um, allowance, um, the allowances. That's just, uh, but if it is in terms of salary and all whatnot, the salary is in line. Nobody gets more than what the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission had fixed. So I call for a more transparency in the disbursement of uh, those uh, so called uh, the allowances of our members. And it is only when they do so that, um, uh, uh, as the previous speaker, one of our uh, uh, said that there can be this uh, building of trust and confidence in terms of uh, the National Assembly and um, the, the, the citizenry that they represent. So, but Let's speak with Edwin Jonathan in Port Harcourt. We hope that we have uh, more clarity right now. Yes, Edwin, uh, the conversation is around uh, the National Assembly. And then um, one conversation that's, that's uh, as ongoing right now is the need to reduce cost of governance on that level. Reduction of cost of governance on that level is very key. Some have advocated a unicamera form of government as against what is, uh, uh, what is, being, uh, what is seen at the moment. Uh, what exactly would you think could be a way out in ensuring that uh, we reduce um, cost of governance at that level? I agree with you, David. You see, uh, the point here is that uh, we do not need that number of persons in the two chambers to make laws to govern this country. I belong to that school of thought that we should reduce the cost of governance. I mean, I mean, we have been declared the poverty capital of the world. Is there nothing we can do to help ourselves? Rather than go and borrow, uh, go a borrowing. We've been borrowing on to pay, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to just handle uh, uh, recurrent expenditures, no infrastructures on ground. I agree that this is the, the time is now that we should restructure the National Assembly and reduce the cost of governance. A unicamera, you know, uh, legislature. All right, uh, we we afraid we we lost contact again. But let's let's bring it home here. Uh, with the National you, Assembly has, in terms of reach, at the end of the day, to the table. After that, what is not happening? Governance. All right, all right, um, well, Chris. Uh, let's let's look at this conversation uh, again. Um, you know, in your 
uh, analysis initially, you talked about, okay, what's from and Jeff, you talked about uh, the process, the electoral process that seemed to have been hijacked by um, some executives and then um, ensuring that um, they, they, they have a hold on the leadership of the National Assembly. That is not working for us. That is not um, giving us good representations from the National Assembly. So maybe the conversation should now shift to Let's look at the electoral process again. Maybe that could help us, uh, uh, you know, uh, address the issue of um, selective, um, selective um, governance on that level. Um, I agree. Part of the problem we've always had is our electoral process. Uh, but um, the issue is not that we don't have enough laws, enemy laws, to be able to handle issues of this nature. The problem is those that are executing this law. Um, from within the constitution, even the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999 has amended. There's a clear cut um, um, reasons on how each of each arm of government operates. will operate. And um, I, I like what is happening now. Um, we should give it to this government too. Uh, the recent. Uh, um, Executive Order 10 that was signed by President uh, Muhammad Buhari was, is part of the processes where we can be able to allow the legislators also to be a bit independent. Uh, as rightly mentioned by uh, uh, one of the guests, the problem we have always had is that the interference of executive. And what is this interference? Interference, especially in the area of funding. Some governors deliberately um, Starve the legislature of funds so that they can be coming hand in cap to beg uh, for funds. In that, in that process, also, you know that who, uh, the, who blows the piper detects the tune. But that of National Assembly is a bit uh, much better because the, the, the National Assembly doesn't wait on the executive. Um, it has its budget, which it passes, and once it has been approved, it doesn't have to wait for any for president to sign off on it, and they get their uh, their responding directly. So they don't have. So that wouldn't be a problem for the national assembly. But at the state level, that is an issue. Uh, and it's but, been addressed now, though. Yes, it's been, the issue is now addressed. Yes, it's, it's, been, it's been addressed. It's been addressed. That's what I say. It's been addressed. The governors, addressed. Are, going the governors are already going to are trying to go to court yes. and kicking against that already. Um, at the state level, that's also, but at the national level, I don't see any, we don't, we don't have that kind of problem. But um, the problem also, as we have is, is that the, um, the National Assembly, as it were, have refused to assert, is, asserting your authority does not mean being confrontational. That is not democracy. Okay, even in advanced country, you see what is happening in the United States. Remember what, what is happening between the House of Reps in the US? led by Pelosi, Pelosi yeah. yes, and Donald Trump. They, the, the way it's structured in the United States is a bit much better. You, it's, you can hardly find any particular party controlling both chambers of yes, so the yes. assembly. Most often they are not. It's either the Republican is controlling the Senate and Democrats are controlling the House of Reps, as it were, or the other way. Except on, because, and that in, itself, that's, that in itself, if we can find that here, it helps. Because what we have now is that any party in power takes over completely the, completely yeah. the National Assembly. And that has always been the problem. One, the leadership of the, of the Senate, most of them are not. The party and the president must have an input on who becomes the Senate president. They must have an input on who become the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And when that happens, just the last, the one we presently we have, we remember how um, uh, Bajabia Mila and um, Amen Senator Lawa. Amen Lawa came. Well, you, you understand. So when there were other people that wanted to contest, I know that the uh, Senate leader at one point uh, wanted to contest uh, uh, alongside uh, um, uh, uh, Lawa and that of Bajabia Mila. So most often than not, once they come up in, uh, within that sphere, it becomes difficult for them to be able to start challenging the authorities that helped their um, emergence. And that has always been the, 
which is why most often than not, even when during plen uh, plenary, you see some level of opposition in deciding certain issues. But the speaker or the senior president, depending on how he wants to be with the executive, might decide to go against the will of even the majority of the way you say, the, the eyes or the nays. When you see the nays, when you had the nays shouting the more, the senior president or house or representative speaker will go for the, uh, for the eyes because probably that is where the, the executive wants to go. And that in itself becomes a, a, a big challenge. Then but we should look at area, their primary area, because when we're looking at this, we are just looking at the, the one of their functions. But the basic function is that how well have they come up with legislation, bills, laws, those are their primary responsibilities. And that's the Oversight next point. function is just part of it. That's the, the next primary. point I'm going, yes. to, I'm going to, but let's go to uh, Bolaoba to see if he has answers to that. Now, between 20, for 21 years now, uh, the National Assembly has passed over 600 bills into law. And we know that this is their basic, this is the major uh, or the primary duty of a legislature. Uh, knowing that we adopted the constitution of the military, do you think uh, they have done so well in the past 21 years? In the area of legis legislative works, in the area of lawmaking, to be very honest with you, because since this program started this morning, uh, many of the contributors have highlighted the frailties of personalities, the leadership, and indeed the methodology that, that, you know, that has consistently produced the leader, leadership, except in some, uh, in some few cases. Saraki, uh, and uh, the now governor of Sakato State, and, and, and Dogara. But in the primary area of work of any legislature, that is in lawmaking, I am, as a Nigerian, not quite impressed with the quality of laws that the National Assembly, the, that the two chambers of National Assembly have passed as bills for signing by the for the signature of the president since 1999. I am at this juncture to, uh, to put a caveat on some of the things done by the Eighth Assembly. Let me take us to the issue of the, of the dysfunctionality of our electoral system and the efforts that the Eighth Assembly made to correct some of the pronounced, some pronounced uh, uh, features of, of the systemic, uh, systemic lack of our electoral system. We must remember that the Eighth Assembly four times sent past bills President Buhari to sign, and on the four occasions the bills signed those bills to law. And those bills effective in continuing what the the acknowledgement of role of technology in our electoral system. And we have noticed that since 1999, the most effective tool that has helped us in pruning the abuse tendencies of our, of our political class is technology. However, as a result of the pronouncement of the Supreme Court about six years ago, on the penultimate general gubernatorial ele election, we have discovered that technically now, the potent and effective role of technology has not been recognized in our electoral system. And ever since this, ever since this ninth assembly came into place, one would have thought that that bill that 
recognizes the effective role of technology in our electoral system, also as the president, but it does not. And we had the case of the very successful election. We are going to another round of going to have two more important presidential elections too. Uh, and so, and our electoral, our electoral act is as archaic as us still allowing room for excessive abuses of the political class. So I'm sitting and thinking, what is the purpose of that assembly? How well are they serving the Nigerian public? Just to go out the copy, just to be just to go out the copy, the directing laws of the positions of the law. I'm not particularly impressed. Oh, all right, uh, Balaba, for that submission. Let's, let's speak with Edwin and Jonathan again. Now, now it's been established that uh, uh, it's beginning to look like the most productive uh, form of um, leadership in the National Assembly had been the ones uh, that are from other parties apart from the ruling party. Uh, and so it's becoming um, extremely imperative that um, attentions begin to shift uh, to ensuring that uh, we don't have same party uh, same party leadership in the executives and also within the legislative arm of government. How can we, in essence, achieve this? Well, the, the issue of leadership, the issue of leadership in the National Assembly is a, is a very strong one. Is is in fact, you know, like they say, wherever the leader goes, the people go. And it, it, the same is true of the National Assembly. If you have a leader that is forthright, if you have a leader whose uh, ideal, I mean, for leading the House is, is about the people, not about a structure, not about a position, then of course they're going to have a, a different kind of result. Now, in a situation where you have a leader who has to be politically right, then the, the, the challenges and then the welfare of the people is, uh, takes a backstage. My, uh, uh, you know, uh, take on this would be that once we correct the electoral system and allow the system to throw up legislators whose heart is in the, in the art of legislation, whose legislation is about the good and welfare of the people, then of course the same system will throw up a leader that will be very, very focused and utilitarian in his approach to governance, you know. The position of the National Assembly is so critical that we cannot afford to have men and women who are simply saying, like uh, somebody said in the studio, hallelujah, you know, to whatever the uh, executive council says. We need men who will be able to say, look, if this budget, why are we approving this budget? How, how is it going to affect the average Nigerian? If we are going to borrow as there is you know, an application before them right now, what are we borrowing for? Are we borrowing to pay salaries? Are we borrowing to build infrastructures to improve the economy? What exactly are we borrowing? We need a National Assembly leadership that is forthright. A National Assembly leadership that will fire from the side of the people. We do not need a National Assembly leadership who wants to remain on the seat and has to be politically correct so that he stays there. And like I said, like somebody said in the studio there, if we correct the electoral system, if we are right in the electoral system, we'll be right in the caliber of persons that the system throws up. Once the system throws up the right caliber of persons, of course, the next thing is discourage, let's have a bipartisan approach at that level because Nigerian leaders, Nigerian politicians do not make the transition, which I've always insisted. They do not make the transition between become a politicians and leaders. That's a difference. Of course, you can vote for votes on the platform of a party. But the moment you are elected, you become a leader of the people. Those who voted for you, those who did not vote for you, they are looking up to you to deliver, like they say, uh, you know, the dividends of democracy. So all of that can be... We must, we must emphasize and do whatever it takes, like you mentioned. What is the reason why our electoral law has not been passed up to now? And a do election is just a few days away. Ondo is also there. What's going to happen? So we must 
Ask the National Assembly to do Time, the Time, Edwin. So let's get to the closing remarks as well of um, Jeff Ojenika. Jeff, now in, in 1999, the Senate had three women, while the House of Reps had 12 women elected. And then 21 years down the line, we see, uh, you might say, an improvement where female representation increased to eight in the Senate and 11 in the House of Representatives. Uh, I'm sure you might say that um, that is um, a, a huge step coming from where we were coming from, from 1999. But don't you think this is still quite bad, com considering the fact that Nigeria is, the, is one of the worst African countries with the least female representatives at both uh, chambers? I quite agree with the assembly election is quite uh, very low. You know, if you compare it to other climes, if you compare it to other advanced uh, democracies, our, our, our gender gap index is quite um, very low, and um, we have to really work to see what we can do to bridge it. But having said that, the, we need to get our um, if there's anything we want this present National Assembly to do, we want to get two things right. The first thing is that we want to get our electoral process right. There's an OIS panel that came up with a lot of reforms set up by a, a, one of the best presidents we ever had in this country. That's Omar Musa Yaradwa. He set up that panel and they came up with a, a lot lasting recommendations. The electoral process, even if you do the electoral law today and not the rest of them, who appointed members of the Independent Natural Electoral Commission? As it is today, it is the president. And um, um, it, it will be difficult to get the members of that commission not to toe the line of the government. It will be in extreme political situations that that can happen. So uh, the confidence level of Nigerians in terms of uh, they are really being independent will quite be low. And that you cannot uh, amend by electoral law. It has to go by virtue of, by, by way of a uh, constitutional amendment in terms of how the electoral, our electoral management body em emerges. And then also moving forward, in 99, when this uh, democratic process started, a lot of people came into the National Assembly on their personal merit, even at the state assemblies. A lot of people, who, who, you know, with very high pedigree, with a lot of things were, uh, came in. But on, um, as the recruitment process, the electoral process, you know, goes down, the, it, it became difficult for such people to continue in the process. And what do you have? Today you have people that are, that, um, the the that are not that are not certificated you have a lot of people that um don't have the requisite educational qualification to be there and they're there and uh, these are things that um whereas the process through us people who are you know competent enough so uh, that kind of system cannot uh, so if the present national assembly can make sure that we get our electoral process right. They don't exceed in it very well. And the second thing is that, in terms of the economy, our economy is nowhere. And how do you control the economy? It's through the budgetary process. Up to now, we have not gotten our budgetary process right. The, all the things that have to come with our reforms that will help us to improve our economy, you know, in terms of uh, solid minerals, the, the PIB laws, all those things are still hanging. So we want them to take on all those things so that our economy can improve. And then uh, let there be an electronic voting system in such a way that let the vote of the people count. Not a situation where we'll finish and they will say there's no back end or that uh, there's no back end report and all the rest of them. Let us really see it that at the end of time that the votes of the people count. If that matters, four years is enough for us to get things right because all you need to do is to wait for the next election. People who are not good will be shown the way out, and people who are good will be thrown. And once the system is just in that way, and we are sure that the vote of the people counts, it doesn't matter. You can just wait for four years and then enthrone the correct type of leadership that the country desires. I can tell you rightly that the leadership we have in the country so far, as, as far as Nigerians are concerned today, if you do... Um, 
um, a confidence this thing. It does not enjoy so much confidence of Nigerians, both at all levels. But there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, there's just nothing they can do about it. Uh, you go and vote, your vote may not count, and at the end of time, you can even vote at the end of time, the thing gets to the Supreme Court, and it's turned the other way around. So what do you do? You just have to, yeah. A lot of people who are, 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 are governors today, not by their people. A Jeff, lot of people are Jeff, in the house already. Jeff, today, th thank not you. by their people. Th thank you so very much for, for your intervention. We appreciate um, uh, your position on this, on this um, conversation. Thank you so very much, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Ojinika is a former member of um, the House of Representatives. Thank you so very much, Jeff. Thank you. Let's move, let's move to Bola Oba, and, and here uh, is a closing remark. Bola, you are very particular about the Eighth Assembly and its achievements of the Eighth Assembly. Uh, we can talk about national minimum wage disability bill, not too young to run bill, police reform bills. These are a few achievements of the Eighth Assembly. In just one, one, one second, or there about 10 seconds, what, what would you think could be the focus, or should be a paramount focus of this Ninth Assembly uh, moving forward? In 10 seconds. The Ninth Assembly should focus on the economy. We are in a very parlous state, economic-wise, and so it's incumbent on this Ninth Assembly to be a bit more creative in how it helps the executive arm of government that seems to lack good initiative on the management of the economy. And the reason why I'm saying this is that it is even difficult for one to know the legislative agenda of the incumbent session of the National Assembly, the Ninth Assembly, regarding not only the economy, but in other areas, in other areas of uh, developmental, de de developmental indices. But I must say that I haven't considered that the Eighth Assembly did better relatively to some of the other sessions of the National Assembly from the fourth to the fifth to the sixth. I am not I am not saying that the Eighth Assembly was the Eldorado Parliament too. It was just a one eyed session amongst all the sessions we've had. So I don't want anybody to people down to think I'm seeking the presence of Dogara and Saraki or the quality of the members of that house or, 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 or the two chambers of the National Assembly there because they were essentially two products of the warped methodology that some of your contributors here have properly, exa have properly examined and presented. You know, we're looking forward to another 21 years where Nigerians will have better things to say concerning the second arm of government. Thank you so much, Bola Oba, a public affairs analyst. Thank you for your contribution on the program today. And many thanks to you too, Chris Wandu, uh, publisher, CKN News. Thank you for your time with us thank you on the much program. And thank you also thank to you. Jeff Odenika and Edwin Jonathan, uh, both in Abuja and Port Harcourt studio. Uh, Jeff is a former member, House of Reps, and Edwin is a political analyst. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time with us on the program. And that's the program today. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll look at, we'll still be looking at um, 21 years of democracy. What has been the dividend of democracy in the past 21 years, uh, you will ask me, and then we'll lay, lay these questions at the table or at the feet of our leaders. But before we run out of the studio, uh, this is a quick birthday shout out to Joshua Uwuyomi. Happy birthday to you, Joshua. Just in case they don't know who Joshua is, uh, Joshua is oh, wow. an able producer, uh, News Up. Uh, Joshua, thank you so very much for all you do. Uh, we want to say thank you for your contribution to the show. We appreciate you a lot and we want to say have a great day, have a great celebration from all of us here. And still on COVID-19, please remember that even though the lockdown has been eased a great deal, endeavor to observe social distancing and wear your face masks, wash your hands as often as possible or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Stay safe. Be responsible. We'll see you again tomorrow. Have a great Tuesday. I am Zikonoma. Bye for now. And I am David Babadike. No complacency. That's my final take for you today. Bye for now.